So John Losey is a professor in the entomology department at Cornell University. His research interests include conservation of beneficial insects, including the New York native nine-spotted ladybug. Nope, oh, we're still not seeing it there in the right format. Oh, what are you, how, what are you guys? We're seeing the notes page. John, if you can click the swap displays at the top, I think that'll take There you go, perfect. perfect. Now, are you seeing the right thing? Yep, we are, it looks great, thank you. It's all yours. Okay, oh, are, are, are we ready? We're okay. ready. And we're even on time. <laughs> okay, excellent. Um, so uh, thank you uh, for uh, inviting me uh, to this presentation. And I'm going to sort of start broad, but what I'm going to narrow down to is my favorite group of insects, which are our ladybugs. And this, uh, a lot of this work comes out of our big citizen science project, which I'll talk about a little bit, which is the Lost Ladybug Project. Um, also working with uh, a Smith-Lieber uh, project, which is Ladybugs in the Garden, which is a lot like the, the title of the talk here. And I also just want to note, and because he, he's not in the title here, but um, I work closely with Antonio Di Tommaso in plant sciences, and he's sort of, a lot of this will talk about plants and insects. So he is the plant person and I am the, the insect person. Okay, so what I want to cover uh, is uh, mostly what we're thinking about is, is this last one, the uh, attracting and, and keeping ladybugs or, or predators in your, in your garden. But I, I want to start a little bit broader than that uh, on why insects need gardens. What's the importance of, of those sort of habitats for insects overall? Then why do gardens need insects? What, what sort of roles do they play? And I'll, I'll, I'll go pretty quickly on that. And then I'll get into how we can attract and, and keep insects and, and specifically ladybugs uh, in the garden. So first, the, the not so good news. And uh, this is obviously now a, a few years back, but just this idea that when there's there's now multiple studies showing that that insects are declining and this is both in terms of the biomass of insects so just so sort of uh, insects in general and and also and maybe more importantly it's in the diversity of insects so there can be less and you'll say oh there's plenty of mosquitoes and roaches and that's true but uh, a lot of the beneficials that we need are, are really declining. And even among those beneficials, especially in the group that I look at, uh, the ladybugs, there has been a real decline in diversity. So there's a, a real squeezing of the, the number of species. And, and I won't touch on that too much today, but, but that's really important because the more diverse they are, the better they can do their jobs. Okay. So why insects need gardens? Um, insects are declining rapidly. Uh, and this, this graph just sort of sums up based on a bunch of studies, uh, which groups are, are declining. Lady, ladybugs are, are, are beetles. Um, and so they're one of the groups that's, that's really declining. Some of the aquatic species are even in, in worse straits. One of the, in fact, probably the primary reason they're declining is from habitat loss. So uh, there are, in the tropics, there are just acres and acres every day being burned and cleared. Uh, in, in lots of areas, there, there's places that are flooding, uh, there's places that are being paved over, and uh, climate change is, is making habitats that were previously excellent habitats for insects, it's, it's changing them, some making some unlivable and some just changing what's there. Gardens can provide a prime habitat to, to assuage some of this and sort of hold back this tide of, of habitat loss. And that's true in general, just by the, the amount of, of gardens that are there, but it's also beyond just the, the sheer amount of of area that could be covered in gardens, they can be really important because insects need little stepping stones of, of habitat that's, that's good for them, and in, especially in urban and suburban areas. 
And, and so gardens can provide that. And that's what, this is an excellent talk, by the way, if, if you want to find this TED talk. But the idea is that just by putting in small patches of green, which could be gardens in these urban and suburban areas, you can provide some really important habitat for insects that, that can't disperse that far. Okay, so that's my pitch on why insects uh, need gardens. Now I want to flip to uh, why gardens need insects. And, and so th there's other groups, but two of the main groups that, that we think of in this context are, are pollinators and predators. So pollinators, obviously, that's, that's mostly things like bees. Uh, they provide a, a essential service of uh, pollinating from one plant to another. And there's been an estimate that they add $7 billion annually to, to our economy. What we're focused on now today is more on the service of pest suppression, biological control, predation. So each year, predators like ladybugs cut pest damage in half of what it would be if, if they weren't out there. And this natural control reduces the, the use of pesticides and saves growers, and the estimate is $8 billion annually. And, and so just another way to think about it is that most pest situations, insect pest situations, that could rise to the level where they might need to be controlled with pesticides or, or something else, are actually held in check already by, by predators. Some certainly get through, but if we had more predators, we could reduce the number that reach the level that they need to be controlled with something else. So now I've gone from, from beneficials and, and sort of focused in on, on predators and pest suppression, and I wanna focus even further on a little bit onto ladybugs and sort of what they are. Um, so ladybugs are insects. They're, even though we call them in the vernacular bugs, they're actually beetles. And so we sometimes call them lady beetles. Uh, in most parts of the, of the world, they actually call them lady bird beetles. And so there is a, a IUCN, a International Union for Conservation of Nature. We have a ladybug specialist group and it's actually called the lady bird specialist group. And so we're not, people are interested in, in this group and, and predators in general um, all over uh, the world is the, is the point. So just in case, uh, one of the things that I find when I'm talking with uh, gardeners or, or, or growers in, in general is that most people know what uh, an adult ladybug looks like. This isn't a great picture one. These pictures are all from the uh, herb garden here on campus, which I'll talk about some more. But here's an even better picture of my favorite insect, which is also the New York State insect, the nine spot uh, lady beetle. So most people, I think, know what an adult lady beetle looks like. Fewer people know what eggs look like, and they can be very similar to uh, looking like the eggs of different pests, and that uh, could be a, a, a good thing to know so you don't squish them. Um, a lot of people, when you ask, wouldn't know that this is a, a larva of a, of a ladybug, and then this is what the pupa look like. So good to know the whole life cycle so that if you take some sort of action that you're you're hoping to bring in and facilitate ladybugs, you know what the different stages look like. And interestingly, you can see behind the larva, there was lots of aphids there, which is probably why, why it's there. Um, so uh, beyond pest suppression, is there, why, why do I want, so ladybugs are, are an incredibly effective predator at controlling um, especially aphids is one of their favorite foods, but they'll also go after white flies. They'll go after scales. They're uh, one of the, the, the studies in, in this sort of uh, mm, facilitating with different plants is on larva of Colorado potato beetle. And, and so they can eat young developing beetles. They'll eat um, caterpillars that are pests. So they're, they're, they're really, 
uh, important and effective across a range of, of different pest types. But beyond pest suppression, is there, is there cause to be concerned about ladybugs? And is there a reason why you might want them in your garden beyond the idea that they might give you some pest control there? So I had noted that, that insects in general are declining. How are ladybugs doing? And that's not that easy to answer how they're doing in general, because most of the data is, comes from um, agricultural fields right around universities, because that's where we do our work. So that's where we have come in with the, the Lost Ladybug Project. And what the, the idea is, is that we would recruit people to go out wherever they are and to take pictures of ladybugs in whatever habitat they find them. And then they send those in and we are able to identify. One of the great things about ladybugs is you can identify them from their pictures. And most of our observations come from non-ag fields because people aren't just out there surveying and in, 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 they don't just wander into production fields. So from universities, we have lots of data on ag fields. From the Lost Ladybug Project, we have lots of data on non-ag areas. And so what have we found? Um, almost 40,000 images uh, of ladybugs that we've managed to identify to species. And uh, one of the, the, the main points is, is that the, the preponderance, the majority of those are introduced species. And so let's just take a look at, at what that, that means. And so just two quick trends, and I won't go too much into the data on this, but uh, this is worldwide uh, unprecedented dominance by a single species of ladybugs. And that's the one that you get in your house. And that's uh, Harmonia axaritis, the, the Asian ladybug. And you can just see this is going from 1985 and this is a global proportion. So if you looked at all ladybug individuals now in, in the world, more than half are, are the Asian ladybug. And that, like I said, is just unprecedented dominance of, of one species. And the risk that if it ever got a, a, a sort of insect pandemic, oh, how could that ever happen uh, to any species, um, that we might be in, in real trouble. Looking at it another way, this just shows the, the rise in black circles of the, of the foreign ladybugs and the, the white dots are over that same time period, the proportion that are native. And so you can see that's falling while the foreign ones are rising. Specifically on my favorite uh, ladybug, you can see its decline over time and it, that's even speeding up here towards the end. So there, there is protection for these ladybugs, including uh, four listed as species of greatest conservation need in, in New York. And it has been um, declared an endangered species in, in Canada. And working with the Center for Biological Diversity, uh, we're, we're looking at uh, proposing it as an endangered species in the US as well. And then it could get some, some special protection. Okay. so. That is, is sort of my intro on why um, ladybugs need you. And, and so, but now I wanna focus more on how, how you can utilize ladybugs and how ladybugs can, can you could attract them, facilitate them, and, and they can help with, with pest suppression and, and biological control. Okay, so, here, just some broad, and, and uh, I, I saw in Carol's talk, she was hitting some of these same points, so I'll just sort of reiterate. Uh, how can you attract and keep um, insects in, in and around your, your garden or your, or your production area? Well, so um, one of the ways is you could hire some help. You could bring in um, and release predators. And this is certainly something we're more used to maybe with pollinators where you're bringing in hives of, of bees or maybe boxes of, of bumblebees. Um, there even you can bring in and release uh, um, dung beetles to, to, to eat the, uh, the, the dung from cows. 
Uh, but th there is the possibility of bringing in hired hands as, as predators as well. And I'll talk about that specifically for, for ladybugs. Another way to, to keep them around is sort of live and let live. And, and again, consider using pesticides only to suppress major outbreaks. This, this idea that the only good pest is a dead pest uh, leads to a lot of dead predators as well. So you can think about what to spray. Some, some chemicals are harsher on predators than others. When to spray, this is more for parasitoids, but you can spray maybe when they're in a more protected state of their life cycle. And then where to spray, maybe only hit hot spots of pest outbreaks and leave the rest of the field as a, as a refuge. And then the, the main thing that I'll talk about is this idea of embracing diversity and incorporating a wider range of plants, not just the ones that you're, you're focused on for your own production. Um, include some with pollen and nectar. Uh, try to provide resources across the growing season because it's not just a spatial question, it's also a sort of temporal uh, question of when the resources are there. And consider including native plants because there's a number of studies that show that native plants uh, support more native insects and a wider diversity of, of insects. John, when, I'm gonna... uh, I'm going to interrupt this as one question and I answered, but <clears throat> there might be a different point to this. So they if they see Asian ladybugs near an aphid population, should they kill the ladybug or let it eat the aphids? I said let it eat the aphids, but with this great increase in Asian uh, multicolored lady beetles, is there a, any reason to try and reduce the numbers or control them? So I would, I agree with you is, is that I would say no. Um, I, I think they, one thing about the Asian ladybugs is they are, they are incredibly effective predators. So they, they're sort of good and bad, that they, they are really good predators. They're our most common ladybug that's out there. I would not squish them, remove them from the field. If they're in my house, I, I tend to get rid of them. Um, <laughs> But I, so the two things that, that I would say is, and, and we are still just at the very initial stages of looking at this is, are there plants that are specifically more attractive to native ladybug species than, than, than the Asian one? And, and so I don't have one to recommend yet, but it's something that we're looking into. And, and the other thing is, is that can you, can we develop strategies that are really going to shore up the native species? And this could include releasing native species. So there's, a, there's a sort of side, a spin-off of the Lost Ladybug Project that's, that's uh, Lost Ladybug Rescue, which is, allows you to purchase and then release the, the nine spot ladybug. And so that's, that's something that we'll work with. And if we can establish enough habitats of the, of the, of the native species, then if there is a, a sudden downturn of Harmonia, the Asian one, they, they hopefully can be able to be there and sort of fill in the slack. So the short answer is no, I would not try to get rid of the, of the Asian lake bucket where right now we're sort of relying on it, but I, I would do some, we're working on strategies that, you know, there's, there's the old saying, rising tide raises all beetles. And so if you, if you do the things that I'm going to talk about, it's going to be good for all lady beetles, including the Asian one, but it'll help the, the native ones as well. Sorry, long-winded answer. No, great. That was a great answer. Thank you. Okay. So first, uh, oh, uh, the, this idea of um, you want to attract and keep beneficial insects. And, and I'm stealing this because uh, I'm really jealous of, it's, it's the title of a paper called uh, The Double-Edged Sward. And, and that's this idea that as we go into talking about these different strategies, we wanna make sure that, and I, and I think some of the other talks touched on this as well, you wanna make sure that when you're bringing in predators and beneficials, you're not uh, providing aid and comfort to the enemy. Right? You don't want to be um, a nursery for pests or for pathogens. I'm not even really going to touch on that, but it's something to think about that, that you, you want to make sure that you're accentuating the positive, eliminating the negative 
don't mess with Mr. Inventory. <laughs> I won't sing, but yeah, that's you get the idea. Um, so strategy number one is you could get hired help. You buying and releasing ladybugs. So ladybugs are a huge business in, in the US. Um, there's, we've estimated uh, over $3 million uh, of, of sales in, in ladybugs annually. And over 3 billion adult ladybugs are, are shipped and released in the US annually. And so that's a, that's a pretty amazing thing to think about. And why are there so many that, that are being released? I, I just did this screen grab this morning. Prices vary a little bit, but here's 1,500 live ladybugs for now it says six dollars note that you get to get it shipped to um, but cheap you can get you can get these ladybugs they're incredibly cheap for large numbers why are they so cheap that the reason why they're so cheap is because you can go up in the the sierra nevada mountains and people have these special tools they just scoop up these ladybugs and then you can put them in the fridge and then, and then you can send them out around the country. Just a little more on that there. Here's the life cycle of this. This is the convergent ladybug, Hippodamia convergence. And so in the, in the summer, when it starts to get hot, they take off and they spend most of the late summer and then winter up in these mountains in those, in those huge um groups that are that are sort of easy to scoop up and then in the spring they come back down and they do a really great job in providing um, biological control down in the central valley this has been going i love this set of pictures that i got from uh one of the university libraries in in california so this is not new this has been going on for over 100 years these are bags of ladybugs so see how full 50 pounds of ladybugs is a lot of ladybugs so that this is a huge business and a lot of people do it and a lot of people think not only are they controlling their pests but they are they're they're shoring up this this hippodamia convergence is a native ladybug um but the problem is that they're ineffective uh and so why why do, if you look on the web do people say never buy them and and the point is they actually mean never buy them for open agriculture. They're, they can be great in greenhouses. They can be effective in these high tunnel systems, but not really that good in garden or open production. And the reason is they are um, they're ineffective. Uh, they may be having an impact on the source population, and they could be spreading germs, pathogens, and sort of maladapted genes, meaning they're adapted to where they came from in, in California, but not necessarily where they're released. So releasing ladybugs, probably not the best option, at least the hippodamia convergence, which are the main one that's, that's for sale. How about houses? So we know pollinators can do great, especially in these pollinator hotels that provide a lot of different nesting areas. Houses, apparently not so much, but in general, the pollinator hotels can have a high occupancy. Well, for there, there are ladybug houses that you can buy. Assessment, no evidence that ladybugs nest, right? And so there's no harm and they're cute. I mean, they can be nice decorations, but you're not really gonna shore up your, your ladybug populations with these. How about a sugar source? Um, some of the research that, that we've done show that parasitoids can feed on nectar, they can feed on the honeydew of, of aphids. And, and if they have a sugar source, they're like three times as effective. So could you just put out sugar sources, and there are some that you could purchase, and, and then have, feed the ladybugs and they would be like juiced up and they would really rock and control your, your, uh, your pests. Problem is there's some evidence that that might work in certain situations, but the best recipe or, or how to put it out there is not really clear. And so 
I, I would I would not advise this as a as a good way to uh, to shore up your populations or make them more effective. Okay, uh, attracting or and keeping. So the best option I think is is putting in ladybug plants, and and I'll talk about that. Let me just see. Uh, is there okay? So that was it. They asked about whether or not the, the ladybug population could be negatively affected because of massive displacement from their native environment in the Sierras. And you did mention this that a bit and said that that is at least potentially true. Yeah, that that's right. Yeah, yeah, that is that is right. Is that they're adapted to that situation, not necessarily where they're going to be released. And that's partly why they're so ineffective. Is they wake up, think, oh, I just woke up in the mountains, time to disperse. And so they're not, they're not gonna, they, they don't stay in your garden. So the advantage of doing plantings is they help other beneficials besides the ladybugs. They, but what are their favorites? And that's the research that, that we've been doing over the last couple of years. And I know I'm getting a little behind on time here, but I'll, 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 I'll try to go through this sort of quickly. So what we've looked at is, what resources we know that ladybugs are, are purported to need. So they can make use of nectar. They definitely need prey. They like protection, especially for the young larva so that it doesn't get eaten by other predators. And then some of the cues that they're going for are uh, the scent of, of any of these resources or what's associated with it. And also they're attracted to the color yellow, which is not surprisingly is is the color that a lot of their favorite flowers are. So how do we know what plants are most likely to be attractive? And the, the, the plants that are most likely to be attractive in terms of a nectar source, when you think about nectar feeders, if you look at these three on the right, butterflies, uh, bees, both have really long tongues bugs with their piercing sucking mouth parts, all those things can get into hidden sources of nectar, sources that are really sort of deep in the flower. Ladybugs and hoverflies or surfids really don't have tongues, and so they need accessible sources of nectar. The way I think of it is goes back to this old fable of the, the fox and the stork. The fox provided this really uh, delicious source of food, but um, the, sorry, the stork did, and the fox couldn't get to it because he doesn't have the right kind of head and, and mouth parts. And that's what happens when we're putting out these incredible plantings, but most of the ladybugs can't, can't get to it. And so they feel the same level of, of frustration. So the things, the plants that do work for ladybugs have open nectar sources or, or mixed sources. And those turn out to be uh, especially plants in the carrot family and in the daisy family, the asteraceae. I'll go a little bit faster here. So just research that we've, we've done here recently is surveys in the herb garden, which is a beautiful place. If, you, if you've never been there, this is on, on campus. Um, and what we found is so these are plants in the APECE uh, and th these lines just show what you would expect. And so clearly APEC, APACE exceeds those expectations. We didn't even find any on other plants, even though there are many other kinds of, of families in, in the herb garden. Other side of the coin, the weed garden. And again, uh, plants in the carrot family just dominate in terms of where you find uh, ladybugs. Just to note that the, the same plants are also really good uh, for pollinators. Again, if you have uh, concealed nectar sources, you find very few ladybugs. If you have either mixed or all open sources, you find lots of ladybugs. And the mixed works very good for pollinators as well. Okay, so given all that, um, here, and this is a little bit of a, of a I, I should have put under construction in big letters on this, but here's what we found in terms of then, okay, uh, hopefully I convinced you quickly that uh, plants in the carrot family are the way for, for ladybugs. 
So what plants are, are there actually available in, in that family that people could utilize? So you could think about this one, giant hogweed, right? It's incredibly attractive to ladybugs. It's pretty, it's got these white flowers, it's big. The problem is it's an it's, it's invasive species and it is incredibly toxic. In fact, there's reports. So you get the oil on your skin and, and then once that's exposed to sunlight, you break out in these huge boils and not to make light of it, but people have actually died from exposure to this plant. So you don't want things like poison hemlock, uh, giant hogweed, they're attractive ladybugs, but not what you want around your garden. Um, if you uh, don't mind that things are, are introduced, then you, there's, there's options, either decorative species, angelica, we found in the herb garden, incredibly attractive, beautiful plant. Some can be, there's several different varieties of, of angelica. There are species that can be effective in bringing in ladybugs and also could be there for other purposes that you could harvest, dill, coriander, fennel. Um, and then one, one, one basic trend is, and, I'll, and I can sort of end on this, is that um, plants in the carrot family are very common and well, not very common, they're more common and much more diverse in the old world and we're fairly depauperate here in North America. So it's not easy to find native species of, of uh, the carrot family, the plant. And I'm sorry, I, I know I can't be pushing, but I just have found one nursery that, that has those is Prairie Moon. I'm not uh, um, advocating that you buy from them, but they do have it. There's a great article here uh, that I have the link to that talks about the wild species occurring in North America. Although just be clear that some of those they're, that they're calling wild are ones that came from somewhere else and have just sort of speciated here. Um, so here's just a list, and I'm happy to talk about it more, of, of ones that you could uh, consider incorporating to maybe within your garden or, or just sort of a planting around the edge of your garden. Do you okay. have that? Okay, I'm going to see if I can find that link. The request is to have that link put in the chat, but I will, um, if I don't do it right away, I'll get it so that it's there uh, at some point. Yeah, I can do, should I stop sharing? Because then I can. <laughs> um, do you have more that you wanted to talk about? That's, that is all I have. I am okay, open perfect. for, yeah. So let's see if we have questions. And meanwhile, um, so someone asked about Queen Anne's lace. And so I Queen Anne's lace, um, uh, can't we, I'll, I'll t talk about two different things in the, in the weed garden. And when I, I left out the whole data set that's on, uh, um, Oh, actually, they may even be listed here. Uh, wild parsnip. No, sorry, it's not on there. So the wild parsnip is not a good guy because the wild parsnip has the same issue. So this is the weed garden, and there's some really yeah. nasty uh, things in there. Um, but so you don't you don't want those. So Queen Anne's lace um, can be good. Just note that that it's considered a, a pretty competitive weed. And so it's pretty and you can use it. Um, we, we are looking at plants uh, around some of the Cornell solar sites and which ones could be uh, effective at bringing in beneficials. And we do find ladybugs on Queen Anne's lace there. In general, compared to some of the other plants, uh, we don't find it as attractive to ladybugs as, as other things. So, if you have it and it's not really competing, I would say it's definitely worth leaving in there. If if you want one that you're going to introduce, I would not uh, recommend it. 